historic house, farm, and garden. I'm here today with our culinary historian, Chef Gregory Funk. And today, he's going to show you how to use some honey to make a late summer salad recipe that's inspired by some of our historical recipe books here at WIC. Um, so you want to come in for a second. Uh, I've pulled a few items for you to take a look at that tell you a little bit about honey here at WIC. My name's Tess, I'm the Director of Interpretation and Public Outreach, and I'm very excited to have you here today. Let's learn a bit about honey. So now we're inside of Wick Historic House, and for those of you who don't know, Wick is one of the oldest houses located in Germantown, Philadelphia. Um, settlement here dates to about 1690, and what's special about Wick is that it was home to one family, the Wistars and the Haynes family, um, from 1690 until the 1970s. So for nine generations, one family lived here, the house never left their hands, um, and they had the fortunate quality of being a little bit of hoarders. So we have over 10,000 objects that belonged to them that span a 300 year time span. So in honor of National Honey Month, I've pulled a couple objects that I think are really interesting and that speak to the history of beekeeping and the use of beeswax and honey here at WIC. Um, we're trying to raise a little bit of awareness about the importance of honeybees and as a pollinator, which makes places at WIC like the historic Rose Garden and the home farm thrive. Um, so for starters here, I have a historic bee skip, um, which is a basketry beehive from the early 19th centuries, probably dating to around 1810. And this was brought into the collection by sixth generation resident Reuben Haynes III. Um, and this type of beekeeping went out of fashion when Langstroth, who uh, this book is Langstroth and the Honeybee, um, basically created a type of hive as we know them today that didn't require the colony to be killed off mm -hmm. when extracting the honey and beeswax from the skep. Um, but in using this, a lot of the recipe books that I pulled here would have been using this type of skep here at WIC. Um, and Greg, I know you're going to be cooking us something using some honey, some mead, some raspberry vinegar. All of these are recipes that can be found in our uh, historic recipe book collection here at WIC. Um, so for starters, we have Miss Hannah Marshall Haynes, who was the fifth generation resident who moved out to Wick during the yellow fever to get some fresh air in the countryside here in Germantown. Um, and we have her receipt book here, which has a recipe for my favorite, which is mead. Um, so we're going to be using some of that, which Greg can tell you a little bit about what he's concocting for us in the education building here this afternoon. It's fun to be inspired by these old receipts and you will hear me later also bounce back and forth between using the word receipt and recipe. The meat recipe that she's calling for, what's fun there is that it's 12 gallons of water and 20 pounds of honey. <laughs> she's making it in bulk. Um, we also have um, other uses of honey um, from John Smith Haynes, uh, the grandson of Hannah Marshall. He has a recipe for waterproofing, waterproof composition for boots, in which the main ingredient is yellow beeswax. Um, so thinking of all of the ways in which the honeybee is providing for the Wistarians family. And then last but not least, I have a recipe which appears in all of the receipt books here at WIC. Um, so a very highly used uh, recipe, which is for raspberry vinegar. Um, so Greg's going to be incorporating a lot of these ingredients inspired by these historic recipe books into something fun for you guys to make at home. Well, hello again, folks. Um, you can barely hear me because I am wearing my mask. If you'll allow me to remove it, we'll, uh, we'll get started uh, at listening a little easier. Um, thank you. Um, as we mentioned inside, uh, the WIC collection is, uh, is huge. 10,000 objects in the house, 100,000 manuscripts, books, uh, on and on and on. So 
uh, a couple of the things that caught my eye that had to do with Honeyfest are um, there were receipts and I will jump back and forth between using the word receipt and recipe that's just a time dated um, difference in how we look at these culinary crafts um, as I mentioned the things that caught my eye inside there are recipes for mead because the, we did have a brewery on the property as well as downtown at the big house. Very, very ancient um, alcoholic beverage. Lots of different uh, taste profiles, whether it was uh, done with, uh, always done with honey, but whether it, was, whether it was yeasted or barleyed or on and on and on. So uh, we'll have a commercial later for where we got this. Um, so I'm including mead. I am poaching pears in the mead. Um, uh, the other ingredients in the salad are some goat cheese that I got from the Amish at Reading Terminal. Uh, black walnuts will be in that salad because we do have a black walnut tree on the property. And we'll be going outside and gathering the green part in the farm and on the lawn. So we're gonna start with peeling and poaching the pears. These are Bartlett's. Even overnight, they got fairly yellow, so that's good, but we're gonna leave them as half of pears. They'll be a lot more forgiving in the poaching liquid. Um, let me do that and I'll get right back to you. So the magic of editing, I've got the pears uh, cored, I used a little, a little uh, melon baller thing. So I've got them cored and peeled. I'm going to leave them as half pears. They'll be a little more forgiving in the syrup. Um, you could dice them, you're just going to have to watch them more carefully the smaller the dice is. This I'll be able to have a few minutes leeway. Um, and they were fairly firm, but I can smell them, so they're on the way to being ripe. So again, a firm pear, because we're cooking it, um, will give you a little more time to just play with it and not watch it so close. So we have mead from Colonial. Colony. Colony. I'm being corrected. <laughs> so I'm going to post, and I tasted it, of course, a second ago. It's fairly dry. You will find them in different styles. Um, they do do one that even has cinnamon in it. This would be fine with cinnamon, with cloves, with a little piece of ginger. Uh, nothing too mysterious here. But what I'm going to flavor it with, and maybe that's a little bit unusual, I'm going to throw in two or three bay leaves. So that kind of more savory herb in the sweet I think it's kind of fun. So we'll put two or three. These happen to be fresh bay leaves. Um, and I'm actually going to sweeten this a little bit too. So the honey we're using here from the bees on the property is Instar. We will have uh, contact information for you for those as well. So I'm just going to sweeten this a little bit to make more of a syrup. And I'm going to put it on the stove and we're going to poach these. Thanks. As you see, I poached the pears. It took about six or eight minutes. That will vary on how ripe your pears are. Um, I'm going to cool. I've kept them under a little bit, a tiny little bit, because I want to poach them, I want to leave them in the syrup overnight. So include that in your timing and in your doneness. Um, they're, they're firm, but not, they're not like a canned pear, but they are cooked. So, uh, that's that step. Thanks. <laughs> so my job as uh, chef 
and educator here uh, and culinary historian is to sort of show you items you may have heard about and either because they sounded odd or they were a luxury. Um, that's my place to sort of give you a taste of that. Like I mentioned, black walnuts might be something you've never tried. Um, they are similar to English walnuts, but they're stronger, a little more bitter. Uh, we had a tree growing up at the, at, out behind the garage, so I never had a chocolate chip cookie or a pan of brownies that did not have black walnuts in them, not English walnuts. So those are one thing we're going to taste. The other one is, oh, and in that same park, when I do the vinaigrette in a minute, it's, it's most obvious to use olive oil. Um, we couldn't grow that historically on the East Coast. Jefferson had Thomas Jefferson had trouble. Um, he even was introducing sesame as an oil product. So it wasn't until the Spanish got to California that we, were, we didn't have to import olive oil. But one of those luxury items you might have seen, and it's a little pricey, is walnut oil. So I'm going to make the vinaigrette from not the olive oil, which would work fine, but with the walnut oil to really kick up the flavor of the walnuts. Um, maybe even the raspberry vinegar is something that uh, you've never tried. So we're going to include that in the dressing as well. So the easiest way I like to do a vinaigrette is uh, just to put it in a jar. And you see I've got uh, a little bit of raspberry vinegar. Again, that's from the raspberry bushes at the back of the farm. Um, and those are in red wine vinegar because I like to play off the color. I sort of upped it. The raspberries added more redness to the vinegar. Uh, walnut oil you'll see as well and the purport the classic proportion is three to one oil to vinegar I'm a Pennsylvania Dutch boy so I might use a little more vinegar I like things uh, tart and zippy um, so even potato salad I might make mine a little more sour than yours uh, speaking of the the jar um, one of the things I like to do is also, this will stay separated if we just let it as this. I like to put in a little uh, mustard. It will keep the, the ingredients in suspension. It won't really emulsify them like, a, like mayonnaise, but it will keep them um, shakeable and together. Now, here's the little bit of frugalness that uh, the Hanes and the Wisters would approve of. I, that last little gurgle um, sticking to the corners of your mustard jars, build your vinaigrette in that next time, right at the end, and shake, shake. So what I would be doing in the jar, I sometimes use, do three or four times a year just in my mustard because I don't want to throw that little bit away. So that's a good little trick. Um, so I'm going to put mustard. Um, I could easily have put in garlic, but I've got a lot of flavors. I didn't want to jump it too heavy to cover up the meat and the pears because we've got walnuts and goat cheese and vinegar, and so I didn't want to kick it too hard, but garlic is fine. Salt and pepper are fine. I'm going to add those. I'm going to give it a shot of mustard, and that's it. It doesn't need much. <laughs> I do use kosher salt. It will probably take more than you might think. 
Um, and yes, grab a spoon um, and, and we're going to taste it. It is about balance. It isn't just about the proportions, but yes, but we're going to taste this at this point. We can always adjust it. And because we're honey fest, I'm going to sweeten it with a little bit of our, our honey from the hives. That should do it. Um, you'll see right away that it sort of stays, once the, once the mustard pulls apart, it will stay, it will stay cloudy like that. So make a big jar, keep it in the refrigerator. Uh, if it has garlic in it, it'll get sharp, but at this point, it's up to you. Herbs, garlic, a different mustard. Um, I will let that sit so you can see that it will stay up. There we are. syrup overnight to absorb as much flavor as possible. Um, we, I don't remember if yesterday when we were talking about black walnuts if I mentioned that these were toasted. So any, any nut would have worked. Hazelnuts, uh, pecans, um, almonds. Make sure that you toast those even eight or ten minutes in a, in a medium oven. That'll just bring out all those nutty oils. Um, so though, there's the, there's the walnuts. We had, we had the goat cheese. Um, we had made the vinaigrette from raspberry vinegar um, and the walnut oil. And you saw me um, in the farm um, gathering the greens. So let me run through those um, a little closer here today. Um, I have to admit that I are arugula had, had bolted. It was a warm summer. So this arugula is from the grocery store. Um, this little guy is purslane. You have cursed it in your garden for decades. Um, um, purslane. Um, we also have garlic chives that I snipped. You saw me in the garden with the white blossoms. These are the leaves, the little flat leaves. Um, we have some oak leaf lettuce. There's mint in here, which is easy to recognize. Um, the dark one is either red beet leaves, you can tell by the little stem, or perilla. Um, that's the Italian name for it and the Latin name, actually. Um, the Japanese call it shiso. So it comes in green and burgundy as well, but that's easy. It's a little bitter, so it really does go with the, uh, the sweet honey vinaigrette. So those are my greens. A little step on ID. Either, um, either go, go looking and foraging the first time with somebody. We don't want you to get sick by grabbing something you don't know. Um, so identification is important. Um, pick an unsprayed field um, and pick a um, pick a pet-free area. We don't want gathered stuff by the sidewalk. Um, you can figure that out all by yourself. So pet-free sidewalks are not. I mean, pet sidewalks are not where to go. 
um, and I'm spraying fields. Other than that, we're um, good. I'm going to combine these. We've got Farm Club here today, so they're going to get a treat by um, not only weeding and farming and harvesting, we're, we're going to taste this later on today. See you in a little bit. Hey kids, we've moved outside from the main house. We're at the edge of the farm. Um, and appropriately, we're by our bees. Um, the openings are on the other side, so they're very busy. Um, I'm going to dress the salad that we worked on earlier. Um, you remember our gathered vegetables. I did want to add that when my grandma would gather these things in the backyard, um, in the garden, in the lawn, she would call it her apron salad because she would gather, she would walk and pick things. So this is sort of an homage to her. This is my grandma's apron salad. Um, I'm going to dress it with the vinaigrette we put together. Don't drown it. Um, there's plenty here. Yes, look at that. <laughs> it took it all. Um, I'm going to put the pears right in. I'm going to put all of the black walnuts in because they're just yummy. I'm going to go ahead and toss that at this point and then just top it with the goat cheese. If I would put that in initially, it would sort of get creamy and maybe a little cloudy looking. Um, I kind of like the clarity of the salad and the veggies. Um, we're going to get those pears distributed. And then I'm just going to garnish with the goat cheese on top. So Tessa's here still. I think she has a few words for you as well. Wow, this looks so good. Oh, you're just hungry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, before we serve this up to the Home Farm Club participants who are working on the farm right now, I want to give a quick shout out. Um, WIC just received an IMLS grant to expand our Home Farm Club to the Home Farm Foodways Project. So right now we meet Wednesday mornings and evenings um, and invite anyone in the community to come help us work on our home farm and we divvy up the produce that is harvested at the end of each uh, workshop and send everyone home with some free produce. Um, but next year, in addition to that and expanding the season, we're going to be incorporating a series of workshops like this one that teach you all how to use some of the uh, produce that's grown in the garden and incorporating some of the history in the house. Um, so I hope you stay tuned. If you like this video, keep a lookout for more workshops and more home farm events in the future. So Always happy to be in your company. Thank you. Same. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, you're good friends. Thank you.